looking at who's going to provide our first aid training to determine whether that first aid provider is competent. Whereas previously, we could just say, are you agency approved and order the training. Uh, the agency say that this will reduce costs. I can't really see that really. It probably reduces costs to the HSE, but not to the industry. Uh, they have actually given us uh, GEIS3, which is an interesting title because I haven't come across that one before, uh, just a guide on selecting first aid training providers. So the sorts of questions we should ask. Um, so I, I think it just made life a little bit more difficult for us. Okay, and RIDOR was, has been changed uh, over the last 18 months or so ago, essentially twice. Uh, there was an amendment uh, to RIDOR uh, in 2012, uh, where instead of uh, reporting over three-day injuries, we had to uh, report over seven-day injuries. Uh, and again, the agency said this is going to reduce uh, costs to us. Uh, uh, of course, we still have to record the over three-day injuries. We just don't have to report them to the HSE. So has that reduced costs? I, I, I can't really see it, really, except, of course, to the health and safety executive. And we're still supposed to investigate anyway. Uh, we have a new guidance for RIDOR because RIDOR 2013 actually also changed a few things. Um, instead of major injuries now, we have specified injuries. Uh, and it's taken on board uh, the over seven day rather than the over three day reporting. They've reduced the number of, of ill health things that we need to report as well. But basically, no, they haven't. They just grouped them together. <laughs> Okay, but again we have uh, a new guidance, and there's a new, uh, uh, sorry, a new guidance in the form of L73 uh, and INDG 4453, which is, is just the, the briefer guidance on RIDOR, uh, has also been changed. So that's first aid and RIDOR. Uh, as per the government's stated objectives uh, to remove self-employed people from legal responsibilities, they've actually done it. So, uh, self-employed people now have no responsibility unless they're working in a high-risk environment. Now, that's going to cause some confusion, really. Um, but certainly, as far as construction is concerned, the self-employed still have responsibilities. So, just because they have to be self-employed, they're still going to be responsible. I think it, it, it possibly makes a certain amount of sense if we have, uh, let's say, a website designer who's self-employed working from home, what's the point in having health and safety responsibilities on them? They're not going to affect anybody else, and they're working from home. But self-employed in construction still have their normal duties. And, again, stated objective for the government, we've now removed the specific link between health and safety law and civil liability. So as well as before, under the Health and Safety Work Act and a number of regulations, uh, we had a link, specific link that if you failed in your legal duty, in your criminal law duty, then that could be used as evidence in a civil case. That link has now been broken. So civil liability clauses have been removed as far as the Health and Safety Work Act is concerned, it basically says, unless it specifically says in a regulation that there is civil liability, uh, but then, of course, there'll be, uh, with this Enterprise Regulatory Reform Act 2013, uh, lots of amendments to lots of pieces of legislation uh, to actually take the civil liability regulations out of them, including the CDM one. So Regulation 45 of CDM is no longer there. It's been revoked. So there is no specific link between the CDM regulations and civil liability. Now, whether that will work or not is a bit debatable because, of course, in a compensation case, the person's only got to um, basically prove that whoever they are suing owed them a duty of care, that they'd failed in that duty of care, and that they'd suffer a loss. Well, can't they use health and safety law to prove that? Uh, I think we'll have to 
wait for some case law to see how the civil courts will actually handle that. But, but it, 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 I think it's just made it less clear as to how this link takes place uh, since they've actually done this. So we'll just have to wait and see on that, I'm afraid. Um, the asbestos uh, approved codes of practice have been amalgamated into a single uh, approved code of practice. So uh, L127 has now gone, uh, that's the, the managing asbestos one for non-domestic premises, uh, and that all those management bits are now included in, in the work with asbestos approved code of practice L143. So it covers both aspects. Uh, I think that probably makes a little bit of sense because there was a certain amount of duplication between them, uh, uh, but we've now just got a thicker one. Yeah. Um, the, uh, 20 to in 2012, we had uh, a change to the notification requirements, whereas prior, pre prior to the 6th of April 2012, we basically had two categories of work for, for asbestos. We had the notifiable license work and the non-notifiable non-license work. Now we have a new one in the middle called notifiable non-licensed work. So it's work that a non-licensed fundamentally contractor can do that still requires to be notified. Um, there is actually quite a good flow chart if, you, if you're that way inclined in the Asbestos Essentials uh, Information Sheets AO. So they put one in the front uh, which actually describes whether things need to be licensed, notified, or notifiable, non-licensed work. <laughs> that, that bit really trips off the tongue of it. <laughs> uh, to be fair to the health and safety executive, they had no choice in this one because it's from the directive. Okay, and the COSH regulations, or, or, or the COSH regulations haven't, fundamentally haven't changed as such, uh, but the approved code of practice has, uh, and basically it's, it, it's just brought the cost regulations up to speed a bit uh, with related legislation. Uh, just one aside on that, the Health and Safety Executive have stated that one of their objectives for this year with the construction industry is pushing the hazardous substance agenda on construction sites, and uh, um, their assessment is that we taken our eye off the ball so far as hazardous substances is concerned. Uh, and what they're asking us to do now is to justify every hazardous substance that we've actually got on, on a construction project. Uh, which I suppose is fair enough because that's what we should be doing anyway. Uh, not forgetting incidentally the dust. Okay, Legionella, uh, they've Changed the approved code of practice for Legionella, so put the, fundamentally put all the sort of main management risk assessment things uh, or left them in the approved code of practice, uh, but taken the, the more technical aspects of the approved code of practice and put them into three guidance documents. So uh, HSG 274 parts 1, 2, and 3. And depending on what we've actually got, uh, depends on which one we'll actually use. Um, it does make a certain amount of sense to do that. Uh, it certainly puts the, the t sort of technical bits into one place, so we can actually look at them a little bit more easily. Uh, just the dangerous substances and explosive atmospheres regulations, uh, they're still the same, but the approved code of practice has now been changed. So instead of having a series of approved code of practice, basically five of them, we now have a single one. It's rather thick. <laughs> but it now covers all aspects uh, of the regulations. And the workplaces regulations, again, they're still fundamentally the same, uh, but they have amended uh, the uh, the workplace approved code of practice. So L24 is now in its second edition. They've just tidied it up a bit. Um, there's nothing significantly changed within it. 
Uh, I'm pretty much the same uh, with the safety uh, in the installation and use of gas systems and appliances. It's just been updated and simplified. Fundamentally, if you were doing it right before, you'll be doing it right now. So I think it's fairly evident from all of these things that the requirements have fundamentally not changed with all these changes to the approved codes of practice and guidance. All they've tried to do is simplify them. Depending on your perspective, you can decide whether they've actually achieved that. Um, but fundamentally, the requirements are still the same. Uh, the head protect, this is the construction head protection regulations, have now eventually gone. Uh, they went in October last year, um, basically because we didn't need them. Um, the the covered by the PPE regulations in any case. Uh, but the exception for Sikhs, or anybody wearing a turban for um, religious purposes, not to wear a construction helmet on a construction site is still in place, but it's no longer in that set of regulations because they've gone. It's actually in the employment legislation, so the Employment Act 1989, uh, which covers that and slight amendment to actually make them the exception for seats in there. They've actually accepted it across the board, not just construction. So does that then mean uh, that if a seek wherein his uh, turban has suddenly come down and smack him on the head uh, that uh, the employer is not liable. Well, that's not true. Uh, the employer would still be held liable due to the fact the legal requirement is to stop things flying out of the air rather than just wear a helmet. Yeah. So essentially if the helmet actually does what it's actually designed to do, we've failed. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they can still work on construction sites without a helmet. There you go. Uh, the other thing that's actually gone, uh, went in uh, 2013, was the notification of con uh, conventional tower cranes regulations 2010. Uh, basically, they, they felt that it had no effect, fundamentally, on health and safety. Uh, I think they're probably right. Uh, and that just a piece of paper did make a lot of difference as to whether the tower crane was properly designed and installed. It was just a piece of paper. But then again, this was the ATC reacting to a number of tower crane failures uh, pre-2010. So they do have a tendency of doing. Okay, and uh, just a quick reminder for people, really, uh, the new health and safety poster, I say new, it was actually issued in 2009, uh, must now be displayed in preference over the old one. <laughs> uh, we had five years to actually change it. Yeah. Uh, and it is actually illegal to have the old one up now. Um, uh, L21, the management of health and safety work regulations approved code of practice has now gone. Uh, again, this is a stated objective to get rid of approved codes of practice uh, uh, and replace them with guidance. So HSG 65, which has been around for some time uh, for health and safety management, is now the only one we've got to go for go health and safety management. Uh, it basically, it doesn't say a lot. And then, of course, we have the old chestnut of the revised CDM regulations, or potentially the revised CDM regulations, which is now under public consultation, which I'll be talking about in a little bit more detail <coughs> later on this or later, later on this morning or this afternoon. This afternoon, I think. Uh, basically, the proposals are that the CDMC, the CDM coordinator, is going to be replaced by something called the principal designer. Uh, but not the total of the CDM coordinator's duties, only those to do with design. Uh, the CDM coordinator's duties that currently are uh, to advise and assist the client no longer appear in the reg proposed regulations at all. There will be no assistance to the client. Uh, the notification requirements have changed, or will have changed. 
so we only need to notify a project if it's over 30 days and there is a maximum of 20 people working on the site or, so at any time during that 30 days. And the 500 person days one still applies. That's just to align it with the directive. The construction phase plan will be required on every single project. <laughs> Uh, the domestic client will have duties, although the way the regulations are currently written, uh, it means that uh, the first designer, first contractor who works with the domestic client will effectively do it for them, uh, but the domestic client will have to appoint a principal designer and principal contractor if they employ more than one contractor on the project, which is pretty much going to be all jobs. And, of course, going on with their normal thing, no approved code of practice, just guidance. So, um, and, uh, has anybody ever read any guidance? Or did just we read the approved code of practice? Um, I, I think most people read the approved code of practice and only guidance if we really have to. <laughs> but that's about it, really, about what's actually uh, gone on. Uh, the statistics, just to quickly look at the statistics. Uh, these are the fatalities for 2012-2013. Uh, lowest number of deaths ever in the construction industry. Uh, although if you look at the basic figures, they didn't actually include the, uh, the general public that we managed to kill as well uh, in the figure that's actually promulgated around by the agency because we killed six of them. Um, but it is the lowest. There's still a concern. <coughs> it's probably the lowest due to the fact we weren't doing a lot of construction. Uh, and of course we're now coming out of recession, lots more construction taking place, where are we going to find the competent people to do it? A big concern as to whether these fatalities and other injuries, etc., are going to increase significantly. Yes, I'm going to have to finish shortly, I'm getting lots of uh, cutting off here. Okay, uh, specified major injuries, they, they've been dropping as well. Um, uh, but you notice that the, the drop down here uh, is basically when we started the recession. Um, I, I think they might be going back up again. Um, and of course this one here basically doesn't mean a lot because from, at that point we stopped reporting the over three day injuries and report the over seven day injuries. So that wasn't actually a drop in such of injuries, it was just we changed the way we reported them. Okay, so uh, I have concerns, and I'm sure lots of other people have concerns, that the reason why the statistics are so good for last year, and we were still killed, 40 odd people, still nearly one a week. Yeah. Uh, but the best ever was fundamentally we weren't doing so much construction. Uh, and they could go back up again. Okay, well, that's it. <laughs> A quick run through of what's changed over the last year or so, uh, you will be getting the presentations, and so you, you'll have references to what actually says on the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.